morning, Singapore. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Thibaut, this is Jeremiah, and today we're going to talk about uh, the security wolf of Wall Street fighting crime with high frequency classification and NLP techniques. Allow me to uh, introduce myself. Uh, my name is Thibaut Roy. I am the manager of development and the research team at OpenDNS. Uh, you may also know uh, one of the projects I've worked on um, and I've been working on for the last actually two years, uh, Open Graffiti, which is a data visualization uh, platform. And more recently, I, am, I created this project called Avalanche. Um, it, it is going to be described today in this presentation. And the main focus of my research in the OpenDNS labs is data visualization, obviously. 3D graphics, I'm a former uh, NVIDIA engineer. Um, but most uh, importantly, graph theory and real-time systems. Hello, uh, everyone. Uh, my name is Jeremiah. I'm a scientist at OpenDNS Labs. Um, I previously worked at Mandiant uh, doing uh, IR and DNS research, uh, Evernote doing AppSec and um, kind of IR work, and uh, Uber uh, doing data science. Um, I just like to solve interesting problems um, and a uh, proud SF SPCA Pitbull puppy owner. And that's her right there. And the agenda for today, so first we're going to start with a short introduction to cover some fundamentals to make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, then I'm going to describe this avalanche project that I've been talking about and the research pipeline and how we actually process uh, data that we see every day at OpenDNS. Then we'll have to talk a little bit about graph-oriented data mining, which is a, a crucial um, piece of the puzzle um, for what we do. And then finally, uh, the second part of this presentation is all going to be about NLP classification. This is going to be uh, Jeremiah covering this part. And then we'll have a, a short Q&A session. All right, let's move on to the uh, introduction. So uh, just a little bit about OpenDNS uh, Security Labs. So I like to think about it where uh, data science kind of intersects with network security. So we deal with uh, big security data on a daily basis, over 80 billion queries, uh, DNS requests per day. Um, and uh, some we're known as a, typically known as a DNS company, but we're actually also have a, a proxy team, and a, we're process over a 10.1 million requ uh, HTTP requests per day. And our daily tasks uh, range from kind of uh, detection algorithms, security data analysis, uh, big data engineering, and distributed systems. And uh, this is the master of data visualization right here. Thank you, Jeremiah. All right, now to uh, process that much data every day, uh, one very important aspect of our work is to go real time. And I'm not going to dwell into uh, all the details of what real time actually means. Uh, here in this presentation, every time I say real time, I actually mean near real time um, for those of you who are connoisseurs. So let me uh, describe the Avalanche project. And I would like to start with a simple analogy with uh, you know, the high frequency trading world. Um, in finance, what they do is they have, obviously, the stock exchange where you can see all the trades uh, publicly available. And then they use a Quant server that is running a couple of strategies. Those strategies kind of uh, uh, decide whenever to execute trades, you know, buy uh, or sell different stocks. And they have a strong sense of the risk that they're actually taking. You know, they, they, they handle po big portfolio and do like advanced uh, risk management. And in order to build those strategies, they run back testing, which means they actually um, testing uh, their strategies over historical data. And really, this is not that far uh, from what we're actually doing every day. You know, our resolvers are basically this stock exchange. This is where we're seeing heavy traffic every day. Um, those strategies that they run in finance, this is more or less, you know, the, the models and classifiers that we have running on real-time traffic. Um, and we also have a strong sense of the, the risk we actually take in when we execute you know, certain decisions. For example, uh, the execution for us would be blocking, obviously, like whitelisting or any sort of domain tagging in general. Um, and obviously, you know, if uh, one of your models decide to block google.com, then you basically, you basically have to look twice on what the, uh, the, the models are actually doing. So this is where uh, you know, the predicted impact on our users becomes really important uh, in terms of risk management. And obviously, you know, all those models, all those strategies that have been created need to be tested um, on historical data. This is our own back testing with machine learning in general. All right, so um, 
couple of uh, points about the Avalanche project. It's open source and available. We are actually releasing it for Black Hat Asia this year. Uh, it's available at this uh, GitHub address, uh, tiboroid uh, slash uh, Avalanche. It's also going to be included in the archive that you're going to get at the end of this conference. So I really invite you to check it out. Um, this is our, again, real-time data processing uh, framework. Um, it is highly modular, parallel, with a distributed design. It's fully written in Python with zero MQ. If you're not familiar with zero MQ, it's, it's an amazing uh, messaging library, which I highly recommend. Um, and this is also, you know, the, the framework that we're using to run a lot of different real-time models on our traffic. Uh, unfortunately, we can't share um, all of those models uh, with you because these are uh, private IP kind of, but we're sharing the core engine uh, with you, which is, uh, again, invite you to check it out. Now, in a nutshell, really, what is uh, Avalanche? Really, the, the, the main idea is to be able to design graph processing pipelines. So you have an example, a simple example here. Um, so a graph is made of nodes, right? And those nodes are basically plugins that you can write yourself, but you can also reuse um, with the, from a certain um, uh, kind of database of the plugins ready to use. Um, so the, the data comes on the left side here, in this plugin, and then goes down uh, on the pipeline. And you have also this concept of plugin racks, because basically every plugin runs in its own thread. And after a while, your pipeline might become a little complicated, so you need to kind of manage the number of threads that, that are running uh, in your data processing framework. So here, a plugin rack is actually one thread uh, in a group of plugins. Now, if I zoom in on this pipeline, um, I can actually see the central piece of the puzzle, which is the node, right? So a node is actually made of a plugin, obviously, your own code but also an input queue and an output queue, and this is all handled by 0MQ. So again, if you're not familiar with 0MQ, um, let me just say this. It's, uh, it's, uh, they implement like smart sockets. Um, you can have designed, uh, use a, a lot of different kind of a message passing uh, uh, strategies, a lot, of different, a lot of different ones, a lot of queuing strategies, and it handles uh, reconnection, disconnections, um, a lot of different things like that. So really, it's, it's an easy way to connect you know, two sockets together. And, you know, use uh, um, um, kind of message passing strategies. So here is a simple example in Python of uh, one of the Avalanche plugins. The first one is a simple version. You only have one method called uh, process message. Um, this is where you, uh, you would implement your uh, kind of message processing. And the second one is a little more complicated, it actually runs in its own thread. You can see here um, an infinite loop. And here you see I'm reading some data on the input queue. Then I'm like converting into a JSON format. You know, you can do whatever you want. You don't have to do that. And then I'm actually uh, sending this message down the pipeline to the output queue. And once you've kind of designed and like um, implemented your own graph processing pipeline using a certain JSON format, which I'm not going to describe, it's, it's fully available on the, the GitHub, um, you can just run you know, the Avalanche engine with your certain pipeline and a certain port. And then you know, it starts processing data. Um, so it's, again, I really would really like to emphasize the fact that it's using 0MQ, and, and I'm a big lover of 0MQ. I love the job that they've done. Uh, it's insanely fast. The research pipeline. So now that I've described a little bit of the Avalanche project, I want to explain to you how we're actually using it to process the traffic that we see every day. So big picture, high level view. I'm going I'm to zoom in to uh, uh, those diagrams. First, we have our resolvers, right? And the resolvers sync up with Amazon S3, and they copy the log chunks every 10 minutes uh, on S3. And then this is where Avalanche kicks in. We download the chunks, and we replay them, and we do classification. And after classification, once we've detected a couple of things, we send this, uh, those results to the production. So for blocking, domain tagging, or further investigation. Now, let's zoom in on Avalanche. Avalanche is actually uh, made of eight slaves. It's a master slave kind of a, a architecture. Um, it's actually made of eight Amazon instances, and so the log chunks comes to the master, and then the master distributes the, di the different chunks with a round-robin strategy over all the different slaves. So round-robin basically means that they're evenly distributed over all the slaves. Now, um, one very important uh, information about the design is that it's uh, what we call a fire-and-forget strategy. It basically means that the slaves um, only uh, record, only process the last chunk that has been sent to them. They don't queue up all the chunks, and you know you don't experience any backlog or any, uh, um, you know, any, any delay basically in the latency in your processing. You're always processing fresh information. So 
This means that sometimes you can lose chunks if something happens, let's say like a DDoS or like a, something wrong in the resolvers or like some maintenance. Or a lot of different things can happen on a real-time pipeline. Um, so really for us, it's like a trade-off to just, you know, we just lost 10 minutes of data, not the end of the world. And compensation, we have something that is fast and that is always uh, processing fresh stuff and never experiences any backlog. Um, then after that, once the slaves have processed all this data, we centralize the results you know, in, our, um, in a database. So this is kind of a map reduce, real-time map reduce uh, process here. Okay, now if I zoom in on the slave, this is how it's actually uh, designed. So the slave actually contains four avalanche pipelines, which are basically processes, right? It's, it's a program. And it's all monitored by the daemon tools, which is an amazing uh, tool to actually uh, do any sort of daemon um, uh, monitoring. And then the results are actually cross-checked and filtered. Okay, now let's zoom in on this pipeline and see what happens. So again, we have the master. And then the streamer is actually the plug-in node that is going to replay those log, log chunks and send them down the pipeline. Um, we have a unifier here, so what does it do? For many different reasons that are not uh, you know, explained here, in a DNS uh, traffic, usually we see uh, lots of redundancy you know, in the DNS requests are, that are being done. So sometimes you see like the same domain four times in a row, and you need to kind of unify that, like uh, uh, remove all the doubles to make sure you're not processing the same domain twice in like uh, one millisecond. It's, it just doesn't make any sense. Um, so this is what the unifier node actually does. Then we have uh, an essential node here, which is a domain tagger. So the domain tagger is going to do blacklisting, whitelisting, you know, some sort of gray listing. Uh, basically, it's going to take out everything we already know, that the obvious things that we already know about our traffic. You don't want to process Google.com. It doesn't make any sense. We already know um, that it's, uh, it's totally fine. Um, and then we have a matcher. And same here. Um, the matcher is basically going to take out any... Uh, it's going to match a couple of single IPs, basically. Every domain that maps to a known single IP would take it out, because same thing, we don't need to process that. And then we have a node that enriches the information that we see, GOIP, MaxMind GOIP, some of you might be uh, familiar with it. Um, it basically helps us add uh, ASN information over our traffic. So all the IPs uh, can be processed, and we use GOIP to um, add the ASN info, so it gives us a country, gives us you know, the ASN number, um, you know, uh, the ASIN information about the IPs and those messages. And then uh, this traffic, so this first part was basically the cleaning, um, the, 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 kind of the, the messages that we were seeing, right? And then the second part, this is where the models are. So we run a couple different models. Today, the, the topic of this presentation is all about NLP rank, but it's not the only one that we actually run with this framework. So uh, we have DNS tunneling detection, we have DGA classifiers. One of them that doesn't appear on the slides is a fast flux model, you know, uh, other ones really uh, that we uh, implemented as well. So once the models have done their job here, we run them through the miner, and this is, I'm gonna explain in the next slides what the miner does. But essentially, the miner uh, aggregates information, uh, like uh, external and internal um, indicators in the same place in order to do a more advanced decision. So uh, those indicators could be you know, coming from VirusTotal, Investigate, again, GYP, but they could also be um, you know, HTTP requests, for example, um, or like a DNS requests, who is a request, or you can also have custom kind of algorithm running on, uh, you know, machine learning algorithm running on a certain grid. Um, really like a lot of different things that you, you can use for post-processing the information. Um, this miner use, uses a, a MongoDB cache. It's actually a, a sort of a graph database, but we can really see it as a cache. And the idea here is to not you know, uh, reprocess the same domains, like do a, like a thousand API calls to virus total for the same domain. So really we're storing the information to make sure we're reducing the amount of API requests or the HTTP requests that we're doing in the process phase. Um, and then we filter this data. We have a couple of uh, you know, decision algorithms to help us uh, decide whether or not we want a blog, we want a whitelist, or, or you name it. And then it's sent to production. So really this whole cluster, you know, we big cluster, one master, eight, uh, avalanche instances, and then we have four pipelines running on each slaves, um, and then you know all of it like gives us a, a real-time data classification cluster that is able to do uh, to run very interesting models such as NLP rank. Now I would like to give you an idea of uh, the amount of traffic that we actually see, and I actually extracted those numbers from uh, one of the resolvers, which is uh, in Amsterdam. This is what AMS means. Uh, each resolver is actually made of a 
couple different machines, depends on the size of the resolver, but here it's only one machine uh, for Amsterdam. Now Amsterdam is definitely not the smallest and definitely not the biggest uh, resolvers that we have. Um, it's like kind of an average resolver. So the, the most important metric here um, is the number of queries per second for the query logs. So briefly, if you're not familiar with the DNS protocol in general, uh, when you do a DNS request, that's basically you talking to the DNS resolver. That's the query logs. That's the, really, you can think of it as a question and answer. Um, the question is asked um, from you, and then the DNS resolver is going to ask all the authoritative servers to give you the answer. So that's the off log traffic. So obviously the DNS resolvers has, have a, a different caches implemented. So this is why you see a huge difference between query logs and off logs. It totally makes sense. It's completely normal that you see less traffic on the off log side. Because it's like a filtered version of the query logs. Um, so really we're seeing like 10, about 10,000 um, messages, queries per second on the query logs. And this is at peak time, right? We, we are at noon UTC, which is um, close to peak time in Amsterdam. Now, if you compare that to the Avalanche benchmark, which can process 30,000 uh, messages per second, so it's about one message every 33 uh, microseconds, really you can see that we are at the microsecond level here. We need to implement you know, very, very fast uh, classification. Um, and you know the analogy with the finance world makes a lot of sense here. And so, uh, in other words, uh, the Avalanche is actually three times faster than uh, Amsterdam machine number one query logs at peak time. So this is really cool because we can actually run Avalanche not at full speed, which uh, ensures that you know, the whole process is going to, to work smoothly. Okay, now I want to talk a little bit about uh, the graph-oriented data mining, so the miner script I've been talking about. Um, as you know, security analysts, if you do any sort of exploration like uh, investigation, we always kind of have the same problem. You have a, lots of different input points, such as domains, URLs, IPs, uh, ASNs, hash, emails, regexes, you, know, you name it. You probably have your own um, uh, source of data that is interesting for you to mine. And there's a lot of information that is available out there, uh, such as you know, the Investigate API. This is the actual product that uh, we sell, the Threat Intel product that we sell, OpenDNS. Um, which can helps you like see a lot of different scores, score occurrences, DNS um, intelligent data basically, MaxMind, VirusTotal, Shodan, you know HTTP request, and a lot of custom models as well. So really, you have input points and data is like out there in a lot of different places. And tru truly, like the turns out that one of the most beautiful ways to uh, aggregate this information and connect all the dots together in a very abstract and formalized way is a graph. Uh, here you have a simple example to illustrate what I'm talking about. Um, you have, for example, a regex that can match a couple of domains. Um, those domains might be hosted in the same IP, which belongs to a certain ASN, hosted in a certain country. Um, and then this domain might have been registered uh, with a certain email address that would be the who is information, for example. And this domain like, uh, can point to a couple of URLs, and one URL can uh, actually host uh, some malicious uh, binary file, which could be represented by a hash. So, um, Really, like all those different information could come from a lot of different places, and one way to aggregate uh, this all would be a graph representation. So, if you actually step back a little bit, and you know, considering that you're using a couple of C's and doing this exploration, really in graph theory, what you're doing is nothing more than a breadth-first traversal, which is um, you start from a node, you visit all the different neighbors, then the neighbors of neighbors, neighbors of neighbors, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and you do that as uh, as long as you, as you need to actually take an in, in, intelligent uh, uh, decision. So what the miner does really in reality is like a modular way to implement like a, a distributed breadth first traversal. And each uh, kind of a source of information is actually implemented with a plugin. So really you, you do that every day without uh, knowing it if you're using uh, Git, for example. Um, you know, when you use Git, everybody has a local copy of a repository, and then you implement some code, you refine the information that you have on your local copy, and at some point, you merge it back to the central uh, repository. So it's exactly what's happening here, except, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's written all in Python. It's like a script that can grab different information for all different APIs and then centralizes it. So why is this so important to us? It's, it's really like a crucial part of the, of the whole system because you can actually effectuate what I like to call the lambda mining in general. It's like a, a functional kind of a, a graph exploration uh, mechanism. Um, once you've kind of uh, abstracted and formalized all this information in the same place using the same representation, then you can implement really smart you know, uh, um, kind of decisions. 
Um, you can use kind of a rule-based decision, certain thresholds, but more interestingly, topology-based. Um, for example, if you have, um, let's say, a domain like, uh, that, is, that is connected to a lot of different IPs, so kind of a star topology, then chances are it's a fast flux. Obviously, you need more indicators, but yeah, you know, it's, it kind of gives you the idea of why this is important. So uh, the scientific term is actually called subgraph isomorphism detection. It's a NP-complete uh, problem, but that's the whole idea. If you can actually formalize all the different indicators on a graph format, you can do a lot of interesting things. And for each kind of a, you know, a attack or kind of a suspicious activity, you can have a certain shape inside this big graph. All right, enough about graphs, and now let's uh, move on to the, to the to real core of the subject, and uh, I'll let Jeremiah do that. Thank you, Thibault. <laughs> so let's get into some detection. I'll just jump right in there, okay? So uh, this is just a good example of kind of what we're seeing, kind of typical example. Uh, hpaypal.co.uk, and um, I'll just kind of explain the overall um, score and, and, and such. Uh, so basically, we're seeing that we saw this on uh, February 9th, um, timestamp, uh, hpaypal.co.uk. This is a score, 99.9%. Uh, uh, and is close, uh, closest to our page in the corpus, so a uh, fish, fishing page. Um, basically, uh, it doesn't get any better than that, 99.9%. And created f February, February 9th, um, updated February 9th, detected February 9th. So right off the bat, we're de detecting stuff that's just created. Uh, so yeah, so that, that I just want to give an overall example of kind of what, the, what, what this model does, right? So uh, the purpose of the model, um, NLP rank, is a fraud detection system using uh, NLP and uh, machine learning techniques and traffic features to uh, identify basically domain squatting, brand spoofing in DNS traffic. Um, and this is a technique commonly used by uh, phishing and uh, APT uh, CNCs. So uh, just a little background on this. Uh, when I first came to OpenDNS, they have awesome botnet detection, DGA, fast flux detection. Um, but basically, uh, there wasn't any fish, phishing detection, and they had this awesome uh, product, uh, Fish Tank. You, I'm sure you guys are familiar with a community, uh, community based, like crowdsourced uh, phishing submission system where you're able to consume, uh, people submit, uh, and you vote on uh, fishes if they're valid fishes, and they're pushed out to the community through a, C, a CSV file uh, or whatever JSON file. Um, so basically, uh, yeah, you submit, vote, categorize, and then filter. And uh, for me, I was pretty excited about th th about this because it's just like one giant training set for me. Uh, so that's kind of my mo motivation, inspiration for this. Also, just to set the tone, kind of uh, this is fishing has a lot to do with uh, the psych just the psychology behind it, uh, human computer interaction. Um, basically, what kind of links do people click on? You know, what are people typically interested in? And it's always cash is king. Uh, people are motivated by money, uh, news, security, and software updates. So uh, and social now social networking, right? So uh, that's just the kind of common uh, motivations behind phishing. Uh, this talk, uh, I'll mostly focus on brand name, uh, big brands, kind of uh, co uh, protecting against uh, big, big brands. Uh, so yeah, Facebook. Bank of America, PayPal, typical Apple. Uh, this is a diagram, kind of a visual diagram of kind of how the model works. So I'll be f referring to it uh, throughout the uh, rest of the presentation. So let's jump into it, how the model works, okay? So heuristic one, um, ASN filtering. So uh, from here, we have an input feed, a DNS feed. We see over 80 billion uh, DNS queries a day. So we need some type of filtering. We need to basically throw out as much shit as possible, right, before we do uh, text processing because it's computationally intensive. So we have a whitelisting, ASN filter, and then a popularity check. Yeah, so uh, again, t text processing is re resource intensive, so it's, we got to remove as much as possible from the traffic. So the, uh, think about the ASN, right? It's basically, um, you know, service provider. It's basically your neighborhood on the Internet, your zip code, right? So uh, domains typically uh, exhibiting fraudulent behavior are hosted on ASNs that basically they have no association with the company they're spoofing. For, for example, if you 
you get sent a you know email with a advertising a Java update, you'd expect it to come from an ASN associated with Oracle, right? Or same thing with Google. If you Google update with Google, right? So uh, if they're not, then something's already kind of shady, right? Uh, so. Um, basically, that's kind of what we do, as Thibaut talked about with Avalanche. Our authoritative logs come in, which are, you know, we have the query logs and we have the authoritative logs, the question and the answer. Um, and we have the Enricher plugin in Avalanche, which basically does a GeoIP lookup, or, you know, with the MaxMind, uh, you could do an ASN lookup on the server IP um, and basically adds it to the logs um, so you can process. So we, we've created a mapping of brand names to their legitimate ASNs. You know, all the companies, Google, Apple, um, everything, um, Wells Fargo. And we look at the, just basically the, the typical phishing sites, right? And we look up domains and IPs as they, as they come in. So heuristic two, uh, defining malicious language of the Internet. So let's get into some uh, NLP, right? So the next step, right, is to actually process the full, fully qualified domain name. Um, and the subs with the sub, we, I use a couple different different algorithms, but uh, we use the edit distance algorithm and uh, some custom like kind of regex automata theory to account for a bigger penalty. But I'll, I'll get into that. So first thing I did uh, was building intuitions for the data set uh, from the APT and phishing uh, data sets from Fish Tank. I extracted uh, kind of uh, I, English words and I stemmed them, which is a common NLP technique, basically getting the root of the word. So common words in the English dictionary where mail, news, soft, serve, update, game, online, you could see the list goes on uh, through Yahoo in there that's just as a show you the, uh, as an example of a brand name, but they're common brand names through Google, Apple, iCloud. Um, and then there's a, so we, I apply this uh, technique called uh, basically bigram collocations or co-occurrences, right? So again, going back to the kind of the, tar tar uh, the, the targeting um, human psychology aspect, what would you get to click on a, on a link? So typically, software update, right? Uh, uh, Apple support, uh, you know, Yahoo support. Um, so uh, yeah, basically, words that often appear together in phishing domains, in the fully qualified domain name. So the idea is there's a brand name and an advertising action word is what I, what I, what I term it, you know, uh, Google, Google update, Java update, right? Plus a TLD, so. Uh, here's just a few phishing examples um, pulled from Fish Tank. You can see uh, kind of, um, you know, there's a lot of spoofing with the edit, edit distance, and uh, you will pick that up in the uh, kind of a reg regexing. Uh, wellsfargo.com billing account, update my account, wellsfargo.com online accounts, upgrade, and so on, right? Here's an example of APT, uh, APT samples, Adobe updates uh, from the Dark Hotel, Adobe plugs. Adobe Register, Flash Serve, Microsoft XP Update, update uh, Carbonac Update Java, APT1, Gmail Boxes, Firefox Updata, which is again uh, why you use, uh, here's uh, the Firefox Updata, why you use stemming, because oftentimes, sometimes they might cut off the end of the word, so I use the root. Uh, so yeah, basically we define a malicious language among fully qualified domain names, and it works for URLs also. Um, basically brand names plus advertising action words as I, as I turn them. So we apply the edit distance and automata theory to that to basically uh, build a spam language, right? Just a little bit about edit distance, right, how it works. You guys, I'm sure, are familiar with it. It's the shortest path dynamic programming algorithm, checking the similarity between two strings. Think of spell check here, right? Um, how many edits or penalties it takes to turn one string into the other. It's uh, commonly used in uh, lots of fields, bioinformatics, handwriting. Um, so yeah, uh, you know, here's just a few examples. Google.com turns to Google with uh, two O's and one kind of, hom hom they're called homog homoglyphs. Um, so here's a th penalty of three. Dropbox with two, two zeros instead of two, two edits. Bank of America, and I'm sure you guys have seen uh, a bunch of those, right? So after that, Right, we have uh, HTML content mining. Right, so after after we uh, kind of flag those as uh, in the traffic, that's our kind of heuristic in the traffic to look up. So uh, doing a, a lookup on the content, getting the content is, is intensive too. So we want to apply apply those uh, pattern matching beforehand. So now we do a lookup, and let's get into un some unsupervised uh, learning learning techniques. Right, so basically. 
we uh, do a get request and retrieve the content of the page, check for form fields on the page, because obviously phishing is phishing for credentials, right? Uh, then we do get counts of the words on the page after some cleaning, minor cleaning. Uh, we apply an algorithm called TFIDF, term frequency, inverse document frequency. Then we apply an unsupervised technique, basically think of clustering, uh, latent semantic uh, analysis, or latent semantic indexing. And then we compare the co cosine filmer, which is basically comparing vectors, right? So uh, yeah, re just basically uh, the kind of uh, intuition here is we're recreating a security analyst. Basically, we're recreating a security AI, right? Uh, typical method for reviewing a classifier results, right? You look up results in a Tor browser. You kind of process the information on the page, look for clues, uh, and then you make a decision whether the page is malicious or not, right? So specifically for phishing sites, you know, human computer, going back to the human computer interaction, what makes people fall for it, right? So uh, for like, you know, Wells Fargo fish, the site will be a near copy of the legitimate site, right? So uh, how, can we, how can we automate this process? And to me, I thought about this, and it, this, this problem kind of seemed to be solved before in a kind of NLP is search, right? Searching for pages, right? Searching for terms on pages, document similarity algorithms. So that's kind of uh, the intuition of where I went with that. Just tried it. I uh, just want to uh, give a quote. Um, I just got back from Prague with uh, Cisco Cognitive Threat Analytics uh, Data Science Summit. And uh, I really like this quote. I um, just want to share it with you guys. Uh, unsupervised learning is the future. It's all about the features, right? So typically, uh, you know, in the security community, it's been a lot about supervised uh, uh, learning. Um, because uh, you need kind of prior information labels. But here, uh, the kind of the new techniques today is just generating the features, because with the features, you can make the classification itself. And oftentimes, supervised, learnings are, uh, supervised learning models are very high maintenance. So uh, yeah, just I'll throw that out there. So yeah, unsupervised uh, learning for detection, right? So this is kind of a knowledge discovery algorithm, or kind of a machine, machine discovery algorithm. So, you're basically using topic modeling techniques to gain summary of the website, right? Because uh, typically, uh, Wells Fargo uh, phishing websites will be al along the same summary as the legitimate sites, which is a totally, uh, so basically, they're, they're exactly similar, right? Because they're a copy of each other. Uh, so it's great for building recommender systems, topic modeling techniques, and that's what we built for Fish Tank um, to reduce uh, kind of... Uh, Submission to uh, pushing out pushing out times, uh, verification time. Uh, so and basically we use we use these topics as features for you could use these topics as features for a supervised uh, um, classification or uh, so basically yeah it's, they're pretty awesome. I use this awesome library uh, Gensim, uh, which is uh, topic to topic modeling library uh, in Python. It's pretty awesome. So I highly recommend it. So yeah, uh, just a little bit. Uh, about building kind of the corpus of uh, uh, phishing pages I, ch I check against. Uh, so basically, I have to train the algorithm, uh, train the algorithm, right? So um, topic modeling kind of cluster stuff. But then this is using unsupervised techniques, and then we just check for similarity. So it's it's kind of like a supervised um, uh, algorithm, but basically we're just checking for similarities among kind of kind of clusters, right? So um, so basically. Uh, Built a, a, a corpus of a uh, combination of legitimate pages, right? Like WellsFargo.com, you know, um, you know the app, Apple login, Bank of America login, um, all the typical phishing pages that we see, PayPal login, on Fish Tank, and along with some phishing pages too, because there's different kinds. There's nine. We see like kind of like older PayPal sites and uh, older fish, older fishes. So. Um, yeah, basically uh, a lot of like manual data collection, collection annotation, but uh, with that being said, uh, it became very intimate with the data, and uh, so there's all kinds of fishes. Yeah, seeing you know p fishes that look like they're from the 90s, but whoever would be fooled by that those and you know 2000s, 2015, you know 2016, um, and you know all kind of like obscure fishes, Christ Christian mingle fishing, kind of all kinds of weird fishes. Uh, so yeah, so let, uh, just a little bit about the kind of pre-processing processing of the uh, uh, algorithm, and I, I want to talk about the TFIDF I, m I mentioned. So basically, for TFIDF, uh, the input is uh, basically a word count vector. Uh, so I tr like the query, the HTML document query, 
or or you could uh, over the matrix, which is basically the corpus, uh, transforming the corpus and, and to TF-IDF weighting. Uh, basically, it shows how important the word is to a collection. Uh, and you could use this as a search technique. This is co commonly used as a search technique. Um, basically, the term frequency, yeah, it's exactly like it sounds. Um, basically, I'm a number of times the term appears on the page. Um, but basically, the term relevance doesn't uh, necessarily increase with um, you know the, the the frequency of the word, right? So basically, um, just because it's 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 a lot, of, uh, you, you see it a lot of times in the document, doesn't necessarily mean that it's important to the document, right? Um, could be adjectives like good, or, you know, or you know bad, but that doesn't really tell anything about the, the story or anything, right? If you apply it to like a, a book, right? So uh, yeah, then we want to apply this kind of inverse document frequency, which kind of uh, emphasizes the rarity of the terms, right? Uh, so, and uh, we do a, a product, a TF, TF weight times the IDF weight, um, and basically, yeah, yeah, we have it, have it right there. Um, there's a formula at the bottom, and I just, right here, I added, I applied TF, TF IDF uh, to uh, kind of just to give an exa concrete example for you guys. Top 10 TF, TF IDF scores and uh, words in Shakespeare's Macbeth. Uh, um, so you get Macbeth, Macduff, Murder. Lady, uh, which is, these are stemmed, which, Banquo. So basically, they're kind of themes, right? Summary, you think of topics, right? So, and then uh, LSI goes even a little bit farther and throws out more noise. So just want to give you an example, concrete example. Um, you know, because the math on the slides might be a little confusing. So uh, basically, next thing we apply uh, LSI, which is basically the unsup unsupervised al algorithm. Think about, yeah, again, clustering. Um, and great thing about SI, uh, LSI, it throws out the noise, a lot of the noise. So uh, uh, basically, you have a uh, think about dimen dimensionality reduction, right? So you have a count matrix or a TF-IDF matrix, where basically, um, where M is the rows, N is the number of terms, and uh, sorry, M is M rows is the number of terms, and N is the columns is the number of documents. So then we pick a value K, right, which represents the number of topics and uh, concepts. Um, basically, dimensions, var variation, um, and that's the kind of uh, thing. Uh, the variable we have to test uh, with the number of topics, how many topics we want, uh, the, the magic number, so to speak. Um, so basically, the process is uh, decompose X, the input matrix, into three matrices: U, S, and V. Transpose uh, U is the M by K matrix, where M is the number of terms. K is the number of concepts. Uh, S is the K by K diagonal matrix, or basically elements are the amount of variation captured from each topic. And V transpose is the K by N matrix, where K is the concepts, and N is the number of documents. And that's what we're interested in, V transpose. So, and then from there, we take the cosine similarity between vectors. It's basically just a similarity measure. And from here, um, Norm, think about the normalized dot product. We're comparing vectors. We're comparing similarity between vectors. And uh, from there, we kind of get our classification, so to speak. And uh, from there, yeah, we get the top n similar documents, push to our block list, auto tag brand names of fish tank, um, yeah, push out daily results, um, build training sets, and retrain periodically, right? So enough math, let's get into the results. So just here's an example, right? I just wanted to give a kind of a basic example. So here was a domain that was a Wells Fargo fish, and you basically compare it against the corpus, and you get back a bunch of scores about how similar it is. These are the cosine similarity, the score I, I showed in the beginning for that PayPal page, and how what page is closest to, it's closest to. So you see a, a page, it's actually closest to wellsfargo.com, which is the legitimate, le le legitimate page. So uh, basically, yeah, it's a, it's a fish because it's not, not coming from the ASN, obviously not valid by Wells Fargo cert. Uh, for all you data scientists in the room, running KFOL cross-validation, um, 600 HTML documents from Fish Tank, basically an 80-20 split. Um, so I just, this is just on Fish Tank data. I just did it because it's a, a bunch of URLs, and there's so much live traffic. I just wanted kind of a controlled, uh, semi-controlled um, environment. But uh, it, it, there's just there's many, many pages on Fish Tank, enough for kind of variety. So I thought it was a good set. And as you can see, it's coming back with great results, the accuracy really high. So that means that's encouraging because that means we could push, uh, recommend 
we could reduce validation time on fish tank from you know, submission to validation. They don't, doesn't have to be flagged by 20 people before the fish makes it out to the community to be protected and consumed, right? So, so just some more samples, right? So here's, it's, uh, NLP rank is uh, picking up a combination of dedicated and compromised domains. So here's just some examples. I pulled some this morning for you guys, some fresh samples this morning for you guys. Um, this is an apple fish um, detected, detected this morning. 91% uh, cosine similarity uh, and basically uh, created March 30th, updated March 30th. So basically the real time detection, right? PayPal uh, fish, fish, 99.6% uh, um, February 10th, created February 10th, updated February 10th, and the first query we see is on February 11th, right? Boom, Gmail, Google Drive, Google Drive, 95.5% closest, uh, yeah. So this one was interesting. Uh, so we see, a, a, so this was a security Apple, uh, Apple uh, fish, and basically uh, we looked at it in fish tank, um, and basically um, uh, we basically um, looked at this in fish, uh, or sorry, sorry. We, we, we got an apple fish, and we, we uh, looked at that on investigate, which is our, this is our UI. We pivoted on the email address, so trustedmon at gmail.com. And from there, you could see there's plenty of other fishes on the uh, email address associated with it. So just one of them uh, is Apple ID privacy. Um, yeah, the first one, right? Boom, another Apple fish or iCloud fish, right? So you see uh, the, the same email registrant registering a bunch of phishing domains at a time. Gmailremind.tk, already suspicious. 96.3%, close to Gmail edit. So we pivoted on the IP address here. Um, basically, you could see uh, a bunch of phishing, doma phishing domains already registered on the IP address. So the main point I want to emphasize is that oftentimes when you see a bunch of these fishes, you can pivot on a certain, uh, you know, label and investigate and see a bunch more fishes. <laughs> so uh, Google Secured Center, 95.9%. Boom. A bunch more fishes when pivoting on the email address. SecuredGoogle.com. Not even up yet. So I, I just want to say, you know, I, I'm not into buzzwords, but, you know, kind of predictive. <laughs> no, I'm just messing here. Sorry. Compromise samples, right? 90% PayPal. Uh, so these pages are pages that basically regular sites that have been compromised, kind of domain shadowing, right? Where the phishing page is located a bunch of labels deep. So that's the, this is the phishing page. This is the actual, you know, rural Makina, so you could see that here, the actual site that was compromised. Gmail, 98%. Uh, Stephanie LaSalle, uh, yeah, so that's the landing page, the uh, original site. Bank of America, 98%. I just want to emphasize the, number, the amount of brands. Microsoft Outlook, 99%. Wells Fargo, 93%, 93.4%. USAA, uh, this, is, this is actually one from this morning too, 3.30, pulled for you guys, so you guys could check if you don't believe me. Uh, the landing page, paramountweb.com.au. Dropbox, March 16th, Facebook. Oh, this one's, yeah, this one's from today. False positives, because everyone always talks crap about that, right? So the false positives for this, you know, the, no model is perfect. But for here, what, some of the false positives we're picking up is uh, Mark Monitor domains. But actually, it's kind of good because those domains are um, basically that's what Mark Monitor does, brand protection. So it's almost like a test set in our, in our live traffic, right? And they're coming back with high probability. So, but we need to filter those out. You know, wellsfargo.com, obviously, Mark Monitor right here. Here's a googles.re, play googles.re, um, and then it redirected to this page, payforinstall.ru. 
um, which is already sounds fishy, but no one's going to miss this if we block it anyway. So, um, and you could see there's a bunch of typo squatting on there anyway. Apple One US, just showing a bunch of uh, kind of samples you could see um, coming back with some high 90s. So, it's working, working well. So, and then just a little idea, we're stacking models. So basically, uh, Thomas Matthews and Dia Majub are researchers that work on spiking techniques. So here uh, we found an iCloud fish, 94.7%, and it's spiking over 1,000 uh, domains. So basically, we could catch large-scale phishing uh, campaigns as they, as they happen. Um, we wrote a blog about it. Go check it out. Um, some other clues, just uh, there's a, a track of tools used to clone a site. We're actually seeing this in the traffic. So, uh, you know, actually it's actually mir mirrored from, you know, google.com. The site is actually mirrored. It's actually in the, the, the uh, HTML content. Some interesting results, too. Uh, we haven't really gotten into targeted stuff yet, but we're kind of ho hoping. But you could see uh, a lot of the targeted domains. Uh, this is a Carbonac banking Trojan. Uh, Kaspersky released it last year, right? But we actually it released in, uh, on February, in February, and uh, we actually detected it at 123. But this, the, co the, co the co co occurrence is the uh, idea is uh, update-java.net was, was caught, caught there. So... Um, and here's some uh, semantic updates, right? Registrant Li Ning from Guangdong, Shang, Guangcheng, Alabama, United States. 21,533 domains associated with that email address, and I have no idea where that is in Alabama. It's just ridiculous. And that was actually in the Sokolov Threat Connect report, so. Just some future work. Uh, we're reducing validation time on fish tanks, so we're gonna push out uh, you know, those fishes to the community faster, hopefully, and now we're Cisco. So we have all their proxy traffic, and we have their email corpus, right? So and we continue building, testing, and tuning, and iterating, continue collecting and protecting against more brands, and uh, hopefully start detecting targeted attacks now that we have you know, the email corpus and more data. So I'll let Thibaut get to the conclusion. All right. Amazing, Jeremiah. Thank you. Um, just so for the, the conclusion, I really would like to emphasize uh, one fact. You know, a lot of people in the security scene these days are talking about predictive. Um, if you actually uh, scratch the surface, it's not predictive at all. Um, so I really would like to give a shout out to uh, Jeremiah. You know, I've been uh, working with him for the last year. And this is, you know, one, uh, it's running live on huge DNS traffic. You know, OpenDNS is, is pretty large. We're like seeing about 3% of the internet traffic. It's real machine learning. And I would like to emphasize this fact as well. And it's giving like some proper results. We're seeing fresh results every day. Like Jeremiah woke up this morning and he's, he was like, yeah, I need to integrate those new samples you know, in the presentation so people can check it out. You know, it's really, it's really fascinating when you actually uh, push that kind of code in production. I'm just the, the engineer, you know, uh, behind the scenes helping him, you know, uh, having something very stable and that works on, on real-time traffic. But it's really interesting to see, you know, those results coming every day and like, constantly, you know, pushing for new research, interesting research. So really a shout out to uh, uh, Jeremiah. So um, you can check out our, our blog. Um, this is labs.opendns.com. Uh, we talk about everything we do, all our research, and, you know, uh, the, in the next week, probably, we're going to release a blog together to talk about our trip to Singapore and also the uh, NLP rank classification avalanche as well. Um, so really, you can see our day-to-day uh, -day, uh, work, and we release a blog every week. So I encourage you to actually uh, check it out. Special thanks as well for uh, the OpenDNS uh, analyst team. You know, a lot of his work, uh, obviously we're just two on stage, but we're actually representing a lot of people behind us. Um, uh, the analyst team, which helped us, you know, investigate on all those different domains and, like, helped us refine, uh, the fine-tune kind of the machine learning um, algorithm that we were using, you know, you need to actually investigate on a lot of those domains to figure out if they're real uh, phishing candidates or not. Um, obviously, the OpenDNS marketing team, um, because we couldn't be here without them. And most of all, the Black Hat staff, thank you so much for having us today. And now um, we're moving on to uh, Q&A sessions. Uh, if you have uh, any questions, please uh, feel free to ask. Thank you so much for your attention. Well, for the big brand names, it's kind of pretty easy, but the thing is, once we see like more different fishes, and sometimes 
uh, the phishing pages will be slightly more modified than the actual legitimate page. And, and also, there, we have to account for different languages too, right? So uh, the, building out the overall corpus didn't really take that long. Um, but um, of course, adding more and more, and then fine tuning those results. And right now, our goal is uh, kind of like retraining weekly. So we're adding results and kind of retraining results weekly so we could get higher detection rates. Um, and again, uh, languages. For the smaller brand names, um, it's going to take a little bit while. And especially for the kind of like targeted stuff, it's going to take a while. And um, kind of from DNS is li limited. And now we have Cisco proxy data so um, and email corpus. So we have to first kind of, uh, kind of integrate those uh, technologies with us. And then we could start kind of like mon monitoring. But yeah, again, like Tivo said, we're only two guys. So and uh, we have, luckily, we have a great analyst team, too, helping me out. So. Um, and, and hit him out. So, uh, um, yeah, it, it, it basically, um, for the big brand names, it didn't take too long because there's lots of stuff out there in Fish Tank. But, um, yeah, for the, the, uh, the um, kind of like smaller, smaller uh, brands, uh, it's going to take a little bit while, and then the targeted threats, and then re basically retraining weekly, right, with the results. Yes, sir. Yes. Oh, which one? The H PayPal? The first one? Uh, the PayPal one? Was it? Uh, that was actually detected from live traffic. So live DNS traffic. Um, talking about... Yeah, keep going. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, the overall process. So that's actually from our, our, our live authoritative log traffic our DNS logs. So we're running this. Uh, yeah, it's a little bit, it's, it's, it's fil a filtered a little bit because it's our authoritative logs. Uh, so basically the uh, query, query is our, the question and our authoritative logs is the answer. So domains that don't really resolve, we don't, we don't really, really look at because there's, you know, the, the IP, we, we need an IP, we need the domain to resolve, right? And we need the ASN, ASN score to kind of filter those out. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, for co compromised domains? Co compromise what? Host file. Um, uh, basically, I mean, uh, uh, they're, they're hosting phishing, phishing domains? Or is there? Yeah, so basically, if we, if we see them in the traffic, then we'll be able to detect them and uh, resolve them, but uh, basically go, th go through our service. But uh, I'm, basically, if the, the host is uh, not, not secure, then that's the, that's the first part. But sign up for OpenDNS, it will protect you against them. Yeah. So. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. So uh, the historical data, the logs, basically, um, we store different ways. Um, Hadoop cluster, we have a Hadoop cluster running as well. But for our own purpose, we're actually storing it on Amazon S3, and we replay uh, those log chunks to do this real-time classification. Yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, I, I see what you're saying, kind of like adding, using machine learning to kind of improve the detection, the actual machine learning uh, algorithm, or the... Yeah. Yes, I actually think it will work really well with the email corpus. Uh, I mean, think of anything that's basically uh, text related and you're looking for similarity, that's kind of the um, background around this, right? Uh, you're looking for document similarity. So imagine kind of like different uh, kind of spamming emails that use the same kind of language. Um, but for this one, I think it works really well just because basically think of a search technique. You're searching for uh, domain or pages that are very close to each other. So think of when you see it in a, in a kind of like graph form, 
the clusters of pages will, if you, if you just kind of examine fish tank on live traffic and you cluster every, all the pages in fish tank based on the topics, you'll see like large clusters of Wells Fargo, Google. Uh, so that's kind of the idea behind that. And then uh, what I'm kind of doing right now, and is, this is kind of hard too, is uh, building a grid search for uh, testing K which is basically the magic number, right? K, K is the number of topics, right? So the, 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 the dimensions of the actual vector that we're comparing against. So building a grid search, so testing 1,000 topics, 2,000 topics, 3,000 topics, kind of 5,000 topics, kind of just testing in, in that sense. But I think it could be applied to many different uh, kind of uh, algorithms. This, a similarity score, if you have a blacklist, what is our domains or URLs that are similar to that, you know? Uh, just the idea, the concept of having similarity. If you're s similar to something bad, right, then basically there's probably more bad where there's more, you know, other bad, bad right? So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. 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 Um, I didn't really try too much. I know the jacquard similarity. Um, you know, I kind of mess around with that on the side. Um, edit distance is a similarity measure, kind of. So it's kind of like a, but it's kind of applied on the domain name. But I think cosine similarity works best for document similarity comparison, right? Uh, comparing basically the angle between two documents, right? Uh, between two vectors, and that seemed to work very well. So I didn't really have to, uh, but that's a good, that's a great, um, you know, idea. And uh, for future research, I, I think. The next, next step is really to kind of push a jacquard similarity into production and see how that performs close to the cosine similarity, right? So yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes. I tried LDA. LDA is a lot slower, a lot slower, right? Uh, so, because um, it kind of does like multiple iterations, but that's kind of the next next step. So, um, t try different algorithms. Uh, you know, um, LDA. That, that's a, another great question. Uh, but um, if we could, if we're able to kind of LSI is very kind of um, it's kind of a little bit more, it's more basic than LDA, but it's very it's much faster, right? So, uh, and that's what we're kind of uh, going here, going for here. Uh, so, and especially with the training process, right? So, but I think in terms of like you know, for actual text, like books or something, LDA is, gr is great too. And I actually ran it on a couple of like test samples and LDA actually came back with some, I like that kind of those results better on those books. So, but it was just, it's too slow when dealing over the, the network traffic and stuff and retraining, it's just, so, yeah. Any more? Any more? All right, thank you so much. Yeah, pleasure. <laughs>